Okay, good morning everyone across the US and Canada. Welcome to our first ever Impact International Safety Call. Um, where we're going to discuss the number one issue for all of us, and that is safety. Our first guest speaker today is going to be General President Eric Dean. Uh, we felt it was appropriate to have Eric on as our first guest speaker to really help set the table for the iron workers. Uh, moving forward as they put safety first and foremost. Uh, my name is Pete Hayes, I'm the president of Red Cedar Steel, but more importantly for today, I am the co-chair of the Heartland RAB for Impact. Uh, the Heartland RAB makes up the states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, and within that are the Iron Workers Locals numbers eight, 21, 67, 89, 383, and 512. I know a lot of you on this call probably know a lot about impact, but there are many who don't. So I'm gonna run through a few slides really explaining what impact is and, and what we do um, for the iron workers. So with that, And I'm going to share this screen. Our, bear with me, folks, as I get there. So, <clears throat> Impact's mission is to directly or indirectly put contractors and iron workers to work. Um, you can see that it stands for Iron Workers Management Progressive Action Cooperative Trust. It's really a trust between the iron workers and management across the USA and Canada. Um, that again, its sole purpose is to, to put more iron workers to work and the contractors that hire them. To date, Impact has invested over 3.7 million in contractor and iron worker business and professional development. Um, below, you see a list of classes and things that Impact puts on free of charge again across the US and Canada. Um, I personally have taken a lot of these classes, there's a lot of great stuff there. Uh, if you're a contractor, an owner, or an iron worker out there and you want to uh, educate yourself and, and just get better, this is some great stuff that we have available for you. And uh, I would urge everybody, uh, if you get a chance to partake of this and, and get these things in your wrap. And if you want these in your part of the country, please reach out to Impact and, uh, and they'll get classes there. Um, Impact has invested over five and a half million on average for the past five years to ensure that iron workers are the most highly trained and safest productive workforce in the construction industry. And again, below you'll see a bunch of stats about things that we've got going on. Uh, apprenticeship members, I really wanna highlight the 19,000 iron workers uh, who are currently weld certified, and we're always uh, building that number, growing it, pushing for more. Another thing that the iron workers have that's second to none is 109. Uh, training facilities again across the US and Canada where we're cranking out the safest and, and the best workers available. And you see some other information there of some great things we do. Uh, one of the things that uh, the iron workers are leading the way uh, across the country is they've come up with the, a groundbreaking paid maternity leave program. Um, Vicki O'Leary with the iron workers has actually been named ENR's person safety of the, or person of the year. Uh, this program is one of the things that's really caught their eye. So just, again, something else that the iron workers are doing uh, through impact uh, in man with management that's really setting them apart and uh, keeping us the safest and, and cutting edge. Um, so far, uh, another program impact has where they've paid over six million is the off the job accident program. This really covers uh, workers. Uh, you're playing softball on a weekend, you get hurt. Uh, again, this is just coverage for iron workers. Um, it's a program that really helps keep it off of the contractor's work comp. Again, something we're really proud of. And as you can see, um, something that's used and uh, taken advantage of uh, by members, again, across the US and Canada. Um, we've also spent five and a half million every year on safety and training. And again, you'll see a bunch of uh, some numbers there and things that are going on. We do MSHA training. 
Um, they have 157 training centers that are really uh, happen within the locals, again, uh, across the U.S. and Canada. Um, every year in Ann Arbor, they gather every, all the instructors for a week and uh, go through courses and training to really keep our, our instructors on the cutting edge uh, and the best uh, across the U.S. and Canada. So, um, also, if you're thinking of, uh, if you're a contractor out there or thinking of starting your own company, again, Impact uh, offers a lot of classes. We put people through the Business Fundamental Academy to really uh, help you lay the groundwork to start your own company or to, to just get better. Again, I know I've gone through a bunch of these classes and uh, it's been great information has really um, helped me improve my, my skills and things of that nature. So uh, that's just a, just a touch of what Impact does every year um, through the iron workers and uh, what we're doing to just, again, as I said, be on the cutting edge of safety and, and all the other things that we've got going on. You'll see there um, some information, and I'll put this up on the screen again before we're done of our uh, next three safety calls. In these, we're really gonna get down more to the nuts and bolts of safety. Um, and, uh, these are some guest speakers who really know uh, safety, it's what they do, it's where they're at. Um, and before I introduce Eric, I would like to make sure everyone knows that this is a question and answer call. Um, you'll look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a question and answer tab. You can click on that, type in your question. It'll come to me. Um, I'll ask it of Eric. We'll try to answer all your questions as best we can. And uh, bear with me, it's my first time of doing this also. But uh, I would encourage everyone to please participate. This is really your chance to reach out to Eric and again in other calls with other speakers and uh, ask them the questions um, that you would love to have answered. So um, with that, stop our share here. I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker. And as I stated earlier, General President, Mr. Eric Dean of the Ironworkers. Eric was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. His career as an ironworker began in December of 1980 when he joined Ironworkers Local Union Number 63 in Chicago. He's held pretty much every position you possibly can as an ironworker, from apprentice on up to general president. Uh, he was elected general president in April of 2015. He is married and the proud father of three children and three beautiful grandchildren. And Eric, I thank you so much for being here with us today. And uh, we look forward to hearing, uh, hearing your thoughts on safety as we move forward. Thanks, Pete. Uh, you hear me loud and clear? Hear you loud and clear, yes, sir. Very good. Well, appreciate not only the concept, but the invite. And, get our perspective. I'm joined with my right hand man, Ron Pixa, General Secretary and Chief of Staff Kevin Burns in the office. And uh, figure if I can't answer any, ask, answer any of the questions, I got my two wingmen with me, so. There you go. With that, I got some prepared remarks and then I'm ready for whatever questions we might have. But first of all, I'd like, I would be remiss if I didn't go back and applaud uh, President Wise on implementing a zero fatality strategy. You know, our business was always founded on the fact that, you know, iron working was dangerous and fatalities were going to occur. And Mr. Wise, and he rounded up the leadership team and he said, you know, that's just an unacceptable practice with today's means and methods and the pre-planning. And if we're the best trained possible and we've got collective bargaining agreements that call for safety measures, if we've advocated for regulatory issues, to drive workplace safety, why do we just readily accept that someone's not gonna come home in the course of their duty? And so um, Mr. Wise had a vision. Unfortunately, we, we fail that challenge every year, but that doesn't mean that we're gonna abandon that cause. When I became general president, one of the first things I wanted to do was strengthen our resolve to say that our members were gonna go home intact every day the way they went to work. So I asked Steve Rank to expand our zero fatality campaign into a zero incidents campaign. We did not want anyone to incur not only the ultimate sacrifice of a job site fatality, but we don't want anyone suffering debilitating injuries where it affects the rest of their life. You know, I struggle today. I just had my hip replaced. 
I had an accident uh, early in my career and arthritis is building up. So I know that you know you want to have a healthy lifestyle after you uh, hang your tool belt up, no matter what your career is. There's no design, uh, denying that the hazards exist today. We do heavy work and we're working with equipment and machinery and it is dangerous. But I believe our, require, our work requires the training, the experience and judgment necessary and just plain old common sense. So oftentimes, you know, we look at what is the causation of accidents? And you look at the innovation of safety equipment and the pre-planning and the training, I know that we can prevent accidents from occurring on the job site. So we look at different things that what was the cause of the accident? How experienced was the crew of workers and the decision makers on the job? What training and equipment was available? You know, shortcuts, we're not gonna tolerate them. The union's not gonna tolerate them and neither should the employers. We look at uh, substandard equipment. We know if we're using the right safety equipment and if it's being provided or if it's not being provided. And we're training the iron workers through the apprenticeship and journeyman retraining to make demands to have the right equipment available. And how can we learn and prevent those accidents from occurring? You know, our industry fought for the regulations. We bargained for safe, uh, safety from OSHA and from state OSHA boards and we've been baked them into our collective bargaining agreements, it just seems foolish to me that then we turn our members loose and we have no oversight and no recollection. So what do we have? We have leading indicators and we have lagging indicators. In my opinion, a lagging indicator is a report to the devastating accident occurred on a job. We can take some of the measures that I talked about and assess and move things forward, but we've got to keep our eye on what are the best practices in the industry today? What are the leading indicators so that we can pre prevent serious incidents from occurring? In talking with a lot of the big folks, you know, like that really looking at safety data, the southern companies of the world, the owners and the companies, you know, what one is your predecessor, Pete, C.R. Myers, they were big on looking at data and then reporting the iron workers incidents because bad things are gonna to continue to happen if those trends are occurring on a regular basis. So stopping those trends are something that we can collectively do together. Both the contractors and the union can work on solving those issues. So I encourage not only these quarterly safety calls, but Executive Director Rank is gonna start using the Impact RAB Forum, and we are gonna start having safety meeting, meetings centered around safety in the areas, you know, we've explored other things at different RABs and we, we have very good subject matter to talk about, whether it be training the contractors or whatever. But well, one area is, he's gonna make a roundup to every RAB to talk about specific safety issues. And there's a variant in enforcement of say compliance directives, whether it relates to subpart R or whether it's our new concrete reinforcing standard our union is on it, our employers are on it, and the owner community is on it, and we just need to foster more safety dialogue. I know that C.R. Meyer, uh, uh, your, your predecessor, Pete, uh, Darren um, Lett, he proposed creating a safety data drop box where you would anonymously talk about near misses so that you could create a conversation about, well, if this is occurring, What's the causation and then how can we stop that prospectively? Thought it was a brilliant idea. I will tell you, some of the employers whispered that they weren't sure how anonymous those, those uh, incidents would be kept and they were fearful that it might be a competitive edge. We gotta get out of that framework that we're gonna use this safety information to beat someone out in a bid or based on a safety record, but actually creating a safe work environment and safer and safer till we get to the ultimate, which is zero. And I wanna close by saying that we need to live the mantra that everyone goes home safe every day. The contractor needs to believe that. As general president, I believe that. Our rank and file iron workers need to believe that. And I surely know the big owners, they expect that out of us, but even on a small beam and bar joist job, we gotta believe that everyone's going home every day. Everyone goes home safe. 
And that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to close with. And uh, I'm willing to answer any questions about our activities. I do have one more safety topic I need to tell you is we're, um, Bill Brown and I have talked and we had two part-time people assisting Steve. We're in the process of making it a three-person field team along with additional administrative support. So the union and impact is putting their money where their mouth is as far as supporting executive director rank on safety, mm -hmm. and we want to make that happen. So with that, uh, Pete, I'll turn it over to questions. All right, so um, again, I would thank you for that opening statement. And um, I have yet to see any questions coming through, so I'm gonna encourage people to have questions, but I'm gonna ask one of my, myself, how do you get this message down to the rank and file member, the guy, like you said, out on that bar joist, out there on the job site day to day? One of the things that President Wise did with the journal is, our magazine every month has an article from Steve Rank. It has an article from Lee Worley, and it has an article about organizing. We wanted to make organizing, safety, and training our three core pillars that we stand on as a union. So just about every monthly magazine has some subject matter concerning safety in it. In addition, we use the website, at our last convention, we rolled out an app for the delegates to facilitate information, and we've expanded that. Our app utilization isn't where it needs to be, but we're gonna uh, adopt a mobile, you know, you talked about this new platform here. We're also adopting a mobile texting platform, and we're gathering more emails so we can better communicate to our members when it's important and there's matters that we need to do. Okay, great. I, I know, uh, my son is an iron worker. He, that makes him third generation in our family iron worker. And uh, as with the youth out there, um, he sure looks at that website a lot and they love to communicate that way. So that's a good way to hear it. I might be a little more old school. I read the magazine every month and look forward to that. So that information getting out there. Um, so another question, if I was a safety director for a general contractor or an owner, who didn't have iron workers on our site or had non-union iron workers, what's the number one thing you think you could tell me that the iron workers uh, are, are, are the safest out there? What, what would you like to say to those kind of people? Well, what we'd like to do is we take our safety training and we champion that our contractors are not only more productive, they're more, they offer more profitability and they have a safer workforce. If, if we're experiencing deficiencies in safety, we have a safety department that intervenes not only on behalf of the union and its members, but also assisting the employers through regulatory issues uh, to navigate the challenges of disparate enforcement of the collective agreements, or, or uh, you say, uh, you know, like one uh, uh, job has an OSHA, MSHA regulation, one has an OSHA regulation, Steve has a wealth of subject matter experts. The last thing I ever want to do is do these fatality reports because that means, God forbid, one of our members was killed. And not only was one of our members killed, but one of the employer's employees was killed on a job site. Nobody wants to deal with that. That's not the business we signed up for. We want to build facilities. We don't want to consult family members as a result of something that's avoidable. Understood. Okay, so we're getting some questions in here now. Um, those of you who have put your name in the, in the box, I'm going to go ahead and share your name. Um, so Anthony Hunter has asked, and I, I love this question, how do we get across to contractors that we're working for that safety should be a larger concern on accelerated construction sites? As it seems, safety goes out the window when the job schedule is behind. Well, it's funny you mentioned, I just left Plant Vogel for a tour on Monday, and it's on a seven day week schedule, and they're addressing the fact that fatigue is a major causation. So they are building in days off into the schedule to ratchet down and improve the safety matrix on the job. Uh, through tripartite collaboration, that's great, right? Because you, know, you could go to a mega project and you could talk to a Southern company you could talk to a Bechtel Corporation. 
but there are so many more jobs where you can't get out to the Walshes and the Whiting Turners and the various folks that we're working for. And they know the industry knowledge. And I, I do recognize like everything's ship shape and real safe. And then when the schedule becomes compressed, all of a sudden, you know, you get a blurred enforcement. And so I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, we're just trying to continue to articulate the message. You know, 712s seems great if you're an iron worker and you're in need of cash, but you yeah. try to work that for six or seven months and you become, you, you ratchet yourself down, you become fatigued and you become aware. So as a union, you know, we always used to use premium time to dissuade overtime and hire more iron workers to expedite the schedule. The, ex, the compressed schedule construction environment is not going away, and it's just the union shop to remain vigilant to make sure that our people are on guard and we got an ample workforce and get an ample rest. Understood. And I agree with that. Uh, we've got a question here from Craig Breitbach. Uh, Craig has asked, how do we work with a drug-free workforce when we have states that are adopt, adopting legalizing drugs and we have this hodgepodge of uh, drug laws across the country. And I know this is a, I've always said opening that can of worms, but what are your thoughts there and, and what do you think the iron workers are doing moving forward? Well, I'll tell you what we did is at our board meeting, Craig, that's a great question. And we've asked it ourselves. We've asked it amongst ourselves and inch by inch, you've seen every state adopt, you've seen the country of Canada adopt uh, legalization of cannabis. So, we're revisiting our drug testing parameters to see if there's a measurement for impairment versus um, um, impairment versus uh, strictly taking a blood test. And that doesn't mean that the union nor impact is condoning the use of marijuana. We, re we recognize we need a drug-free workforce, but we, we have monitored through some of the um, uh, large owner groups, power suppliers, and looking for different measurements for impairment. It's a challenge that we don't have the answer to, but we are measuring whether we're going to apply different kind of testing or do more pre-employment testing to ensure that contractors' confidence that they hasn't had a test just within a year, but they got something to be able to say, hey, we tested the guy uh, in advance of the job or increasing uh, the randoms but that's kind of the remedy right now and uh, i seen that impact uh, wanted to join in on the answer but i don't know how we accommodate that i understood a demo on this brand new thing that i'm using for the first time that impact uh, wanted to a help answer that question but uh, if someone if uh, joe matos do you want to jump in is somebody is somebody with you that wants to answer that <laughs> I think uh, Kevin uh, wanted to uh, ask. Um, Kevin, do you want to unmute and ask? Ask or answer. I thought I saw a sign. Impact would like to answer that question. We're going to move along, and then we'll figure out how to get that done. All right, Pete. Okay. So I have a, a question. Or go ahead. I hear Kevin now. Just let you know. What's that, Kevin? I said I unmuted uh, really quick, and it, the question was not for me. I, I don't know who it came from. I can't see the questions. It said Ironwork, Ironwork Impact would like to answer that question in a little blue banner, and hmm. maybe I just misread, misread something. Sorry there. Hey, North Michigan tie today. I like your tie. <laughs> go ahead. There we go. All right, so um, along the same line, um, Dave Smith's dad, who uh, I, I have to ask his question. He's our he's our monthly uh, safety coordinator, director for our safety call in the Heartland Rab, and he is uh, head of safety and, and a bunch of other stuff for C.R. Meyer. Dave has uh, said that he appreciates the impacts drug testing. He asks, however, is there a possibility of referring the program to be current within impact? Um, prior to being able to dispatch to a job. He said the Boilermakers have a program this way and allows a contractor to be hands off. Before you answer that, I'll throw in there, um, I know some of those answers are difficult. I know in the state of Minnesota, they have laws that we have to 
offer employment prior to drug testing an employee. So it's a hodgepodge of, of things, but if you'd like to, to delve into that, it's, we certainly would welcome that. But again, he's curious if it's possible to get the program set up so that impact really uh, does all the testing and determines whether or not a member is ready to be employed without the, uh, the contractor having to do that. I'm gonna give a long answer that's not probably gonna be the, uh, to Dave's liking, but I'll just get around. Drug testing is a permissive subject to collective bargaining. And as you rightfully had indicated, every state has a different advance notice to its employees on a change in the policy and the protocol. So what IMPACT did was we recognized that there was a need for fit for duty drug tests. I've been a trustee for since virtually day one as an RAB co-chair out of Chicago. So I sat there and as we developed the programs, we decided we would create a baseline measurement with a 10 panel test, which is really more like 11 or 12. And we would provide sample language to local unions to mutually bargain in each collective bargaining agreement, the impact uh, language. So, and then they had to follow their state's initiatives as far as the implementation and the phasing of that in. We had some carve outs in Detroit. They had the auto industry. And instead of the, the Boilermakers have, I believe what's called a most program. And uh, in Detroit, they have a must program, or I might have that backwards. But we weren't gonna reinvent the wheel as far as the auto industry's accepted methodology for getting on site. In Northwest Indiana, they had the RC, R, uh, the BBR, there's an acronym for it, and it's the, uh, the BCRC. BCR, BCRC. BCRC, yeah. Yes. And with the BCRC, they said, you're not coming in my steel mill, you're not coming in my refinery and all that major industrial complex. We got a drug testing program. So impact in those cases, we facilitated the cost up to the equivalency of what our negotiated rate was to mirror what's the best for those employers and those iron workers to get on site. Then we left it up to everyone else, and here's the other variant. Some locals have a referral hall where members can shop and get their own jobs, and the contractors can call someone up and call them back. Other locals have hiring halls exclusive where every dispatch goes through the union hall. And you, what you do for one employee, you have to do for another. So we got to make sure you're not just drug testing to dispatch iron workers, that every employee on the job, there's a unified program. So we used to have, many of the union halls had it, you can't sign our out of work list and be dispatched if you don't go to work. And that still exists today in some areas. But in other areas where contractors have the luxury of being able to call an iron worker that worked for them before back, or they got a word of mouth that this guy's a top hand or a gal, and uh, they're, they're the best thing for their company. If they go to work directly, they can't have a disparate drug testing program. So our goal has been try to make parity in the industry. Then we decided to make the randoms where the employer tells the um, worker uh, based on the last number, the social security number, hey, it's time to go for your random because we were doing the birthday anniversary and with the masking agents and people's ability to full test, we didn't want to say, hey, every date certain you're going to go for your drug test because we felt people were fooling the uh, compliance issues. And so then we put the random in there, but the utilization, Dave, I agree with you. We looked at the number and while we're also looking at the drug testing parameters for Craig's question about increased use of uh, and legalization of marijuana, we're also looking at utilization of the program. And there's a committee assigned um, internally of labor and management to look at both of those. So it doesn't give you the answer you want, Dave. It won't be eye for eye with the Boilermaker, but Boilermaker has less field conditions um, 
they have less fuel employees. They have more shipbuilders and cement builders than we do. And so the issue for me is, I apologize, I gotta stop this phone call from buzzing here. Um, so the issue for us is, um, you know, we're working on it and we're trying to have a better program that has more inclusion and it's more contractor friendly. And we would welcome your input uh, to, uh, to, um, to uh, jump on that committee if you're not on it already, Dave. Long answer for a, a, a not such a clear uh, yeah. answer. So it's, a, it's always a tough one, right? Every time we, every time, every conversation I've ever been in a drug testing, it, it I got there never seems to be clarity. I got people going to the clinic three, four, five times a year here that have never failed one drug test, and we're looking at it. And we feel like we can't have drug testing and say from the international's perspective, this is a good thing if we don't adhere to it. But then now my HR guy's going, you know, it's messing productivity. You got some of your clerical staffs going five, six, seven times. Those numbers on the Social Security number keep coming up. How many times we got a drug test person before we figure out they're not using drugs? So it's not... Yeah. We're in an employment role here, and we sh we share um, we share the concern about having a ready uh, ready drug free workforce, and the liberalization of marijuana is not going away. I'm afraid everyone's seeing the tax revenue benefit from it. Yeah, that is correct. Or okay. They can um, tax revenue benefits. Yeah. So we got another question here, kind of changing gears. Joe Higgs has asked. Is it up to the locals to have a BA or a local person looking at safety during their site visits? And I'll add on to that because um, I think the answer is maybe no, but what, it, what do you tell local reps when they go out on site? Is it their responsibility to look at safety? In what way protect the members? So what are your thoughts on that? I would say the business agent's job is to enforce a collective bargaining agreement. And if there are safety measures collectively bargained in the agreement, by all means, the union representative, if he's called to a job site, should address those issues. Oftentimes, the steward on the job site is someone who the members look to to say, hey, look, there's open holes in the decking. We need, we need someone to address those issues. And, and the, so they feel like they need a job site advocate. They need someone from the union advocating that. But you know what? Contractors can subcontract that responsibility. Whoever you designate as your competent people on the job site, the supervisors, it's as much the supervisor's responsibility and the employer's responsibility. But I would say that the union, if they see something, you know, we, we've been preaching see something, say something. We believe that if the union's got to come and call bull crap on something uh, because the members are too reluctant, that we are going to encourage the union to do it. We don't want them to be uh, the sole decider in lieu of OSHA or any regulatory agency, just enforcing the collective bargaining agreement as it exists as it relates to safety. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, next question. Does the safety department have a safety certification for safety directors? We have not only a safety director's course, we have a safety supervisor's course, and we're trying to get both. And Steve, you can chime in if you're on the phone, if I misspeak or use the wrong terminology. But we're trying to recognize the difference for both. We're growing organically iron workers to tend to needs of safety and obtain jobs. And then we're trying to do that at a higher level for company safety folks. And then we have those courses that we're doing uh, around the country, different geographical regions for more enlightenment. And so there's the high level, and then there's the individual like rank and file, and we still do STSC where it's required, but Steve has got some more advanced level courses in addition to those that we hope are um, mutually beneficial to the employer and to our workforce. And then we can get, we can get iron workers to, hang up their tool belt and adopt safety specialists within comp large companies that have a safety supervisor and safety director. We feel like they best understand the challenges that the rank and file has and how to overcome those challenges so that we can be compliant and safe. All right. Uh, 
Next, uh, we have a comment and a question from Kevin Hildebrandt. I know Kevin personally, he's with Myron Construction. Uh, he wants to say that he sees a significant positive difference between iron workers and the other trades. He believes that uh, much of that difference stems from what impact and the RRBs are doing and developing and implementing uh, at the highest level. From a contractor's perspective, we push these issues, but it works best when we all push together. Thank you very much for pushing and continuous improvement. Keep doing what we're doing. With that, his question is, what other RABs are currently holding a monthly call in? He said, I, I think this would be great value for all. Um, you can answer that. I, I think that Heartland RABs is the only one, but maybe there's some more. Well, the issue is, is this is the inaugural invite to everyone to replicate what Pete's team is doing over there with uh, Mike Baker and um, Zach Gorman. And we, what we do with Impact is we use it as an incubator and we try and take best practices. And if it's a good idea somewhere, we try and uh, implore that to be the, the way that everyone does it through either imitation or through mandate. And so this conference call was a way of wetting that appetite to invite more people to participate. And then, as I told you, uh, Steve Rank plans on doing the round robin tour to every uh, region so that we can have just safety conversations if there relates to RAB. We can, and then we probably can invite this conference call. This technology that we just implemented here, we have voice over IP phone, uh, General Secretary um, picks up, oversees the IT department, and we felt like things, uh, Skype were choppy. There's a lot of projects, uh, uh, programs, go to meeting. This simply works over a computer line. It's attached to all of our staff's cell phones. It's gonna be attached uh, throughout our office. And uh, so voice over IP is a new line of technology. This seems to be working pretty well for our inaugural run. And we would hope and encourage everyone to adopt a similar platform on a regional basis. So yeah, I appreciate the compliments. I believe that Impact has created an environment where instead of bargaining every three years and hurling insults and demeaning each other and going away with bruised feelings, we now meet on a regular basis and we come to industry solutions that help both the ironworkers and the employers for the 85% of the things that we mutually agree on. Usually we just barter over the difference of uh, divvying up the company's profits, whether the men gets those, uh, men and women get those in lieu of wages, or whether you get them uh, as far as, uh, uh, you know, the supplying the company with additional cash reserves for growing the company. And that's, uh, that's been collect the nature of collective bargaining for a long period of time. Once we get past that, impact fosters way more positive industry solutions than it does to a detriment. And it allows, it allows hard topics to be discussed on an interim basis rather than festering and holding up uh, animus towards and saving everything for collective bargaining route. Kevin? Just, just a quick FYI, because it is, I mean, you know, the, these type of forum or fora, however the hell you would say plural forum, uh, started there with Darren Ladd and, and Colin. Uh, and, and obviously this has evolved to this forum, which is, I think is awesome. Steve also is doing three safety summits out in the West uh, this spring in Las Vegas and in Northern and Southern California. So that's a different approach to the same type of thing because let's face it, you know, all the politics are local or all the issues are local. But, you know, it's just like Eric said, it's basically trying to amalgamate what the best practice is and use that to the maximum effort. And, and those, those uh, safety summits out west are uh, listed on the website. We welcome any and all uh, attendees. <clears throat> okay. Um, with that, I see that uh, Dave Smeestad has, because I know earlier, Eric, you had mentioned the website reporting, which we use in our region that, uh, that C.R. Meyer uh, developed. He's um, given me a kind of a link here to that. I wish I knew how to share 
what he I, sent me. I see it on the menu. I assume everyone sees that. So, oh, uh, maybe everyone does. Okay. Uh, so, Kevin, can you chime in? Do you see Dave C. Smith said got the impact safety reporting.org? Is that for everyone to see? Or yeah. is that only for the facilitators? No, oh, no, that's for any contractor and or local union. In the no, world. that's not, that wasn't my question. Is every, is all 61 people on the call able to see that little menu of questions and answers on the right side? You know what, I'm not sure, but I'm going to copy that link and shoot it out to everybody who. Okay. Very good. Yeah. That'd Thank be you. great. Um, okay, so next we have a question here from Steve. Haney, or Haney, Steve, I certainly hope I... You know what, uh, I, I don't want to skip past Joe and Phil had some questions. Okay. Uh, Joe, oh, you're I, seeing them too. Yeah, Joe, is, uh, is there any information on training that addresses safety versus schedule? I believe through the Impact website, and Steve sends out a lot of bulletins, um, you're talking about uh, if safety is compromised when the work hours increase, and I would defer that to the subject matter experts in the safety department. I, I don't have that answer off the top of my head, but Steve, mm -hmm. uh, Steve is always available to answer those questions and, and his department. Ms. Vicky O'Leary, Jeff Norris up in Canada, we're going to be adding additional staff, so you can get that answered offline from Steve Rank, please. And then you want to go over Phil's question there? Yeah, Phil, uh, and the only reason I skipped by those, I should I should state that uh, Joe and Phil both work for me. So oh, um, okay. I'm, thr I'm, thrilled, I'm thrilled that they're asking questions. That's but, okay. Yeah. Uh, so Phil has asked questions really about, and again, I know this these questions might be more nuts and bolts, but um, how do we tie off and move around uh, when ground atop of steel is less than 16 foot one? And then he followed up with talking about most because Phil's in our, our Colorado office. I'm going to give you an editorial answer to that. So CENRAC is something, it's steel erection negotiated rulemaking. It's an allowable difference from OSHA, but there are some contractors who insist on OSHA and OSHA only, and they don't allow you the variant. And you know, that's been an age old thing where a lot of ironworker locals and a lot of contractors think it's a natural birthright to exempt with a written plan, but I believe owners and some contractors can meet or exceed OSHA's requirements. And if that's the case, our union is gonna be compliant with the requirements. As far as the erecting steel less than 16 uh, uh, foot one, I would defer that over to, that's a question that Steve could follow up and answer individually, so. All right, sorry, Steve Haney, right? Yes, yeah, Steve Haney. So Steve has asked, what can be done to get safety being a major concern in design of construction and not put all safety on the individual iron worker by piling on more PPE? And I would, uh, I would back up that question and, and, and love to hear your thoughts there. Well, you know, uh, we, we, we talked briefly earlier about the compressed schedule. The compressed schedule has done things to the point where Oftentimes, it expands scope on steel design. Uh, a lot of times, engineering to a de deficit is not as far along on large projects as it needs to be. So you're seeing steel come out, and then it gets modified and different things. The worker, my son, is a rank and file fifth generation iron worker working out in the city of Chicago. And he, he, he shares work stories with me. And he has as many as eight lanyards on his tool belt to work aloft to stop the drop. And he just says it becomes cumbersome because things get twisted up and tied up. And then Steve and I have talked about, you know, iron workers trying to be safe. They put a retractable device on and then they're not using it. They're using it outside the scope of the recommendation. They think they're safely tied off, but... Uh, sometimes they're misapplying the application. So it is, uh, it is an insurance dominated world and the insurance companies regulate you, the employers. The union is trying to be compliant with the regulatory and the collectively bargain issues. But it is, uh, you know, I, I just left uh, Plant Vogel. I, I had 
mandatory glove participation. I get the eyeglass thing from the eyewear. They said that they can document data about mandatory glove uh, is causing reducing hand injuries, and they got the data to prove it. Um, stopping the drop is something that's uh, significantly different, and many contractors complain that the productivity gets diminished when they get what they believe is a onerous safety application, and I'll give you an example. We all know that the oil refinery petrochemical area has really stringent safety requirements, and, and rightfully so. You know, they want their refineries in the safest possible manner. Well, recently Marathon Oil built an office building in uh, central Ohio, and they took their refinery safety parameters and they put them on the job. And the contractor was protesting. He goes, I didn't think you were going to do the refinery uh, restraints to me on this job site. I'm not going to be very profitable. And the iron workers, uh, they just, uh, they would not uh, deviate from their six foot fall protection uh, and all the things they apply over on their refinery side on their six foot office edition space. You know, I have to plot anything that tries to send our members home like where I started, intact and 100% but it is cumbersome with all the PPE. And when you see some of these iron workers, they are like loaded for bear as far as the amount of equipment and safety equipment that they have to utilize. Yeah, I would agree with that. I picked up my son's belt one day and uh, I, I just kind of shook my head. I don't know how he carries that load around. I go back to the, my days and uh, we didn't have all that stuff, but uh, thank you for that answer. So uh, Dennis Hayden has asked, should the local notify the hiring contractor of past safety or drug violations of individuals coming out of the hall, especially if the worker has a history of these issues? There is a medical review officer. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out if an iron worker hall dispatches a member and he comes back, but there is a privacy requirement and there's a, there's a third party uh, intermediary so I don't know that you could do that and sometimes I don't know that the iron worker hall knows of past accidents um, uh, clearly you should be made aware of someone's um, has an issue and I, I get the the nature of the question just don't always know that as a business agent in my local I, I had uh, 1500 members probably had thousand active members you can't possibly know everyone's work history that's getting dispatched at all, but there should be some best effort to be square with the contractor for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave Smeestead has kind of put this out more as again, uh, his thoughts, but he says, thanks to the iron workers for continuously being on the safe, around the cutting edge of training, safety, business, professionalism, and never letting off the gas when it comes to further safety of their members, which in turn makes signatories more competitive across the markets we compete in. And, and I would second that also. Um, and I think, again, this, this call is just another indication of, of the iron workers being on the cutting edge. So we thank you for that. Um, question here from Dave Lombardi. He has asked, how are you handling the ongoing problem of distractive driving and accidents in the construction industry? Well, that's a pet peeve of mine. You know, maybe it's attributable to the gray hair or whatever. I was driving, driving home from a hunting trip with my nephew driving, and he's got the, his thumbs on the thing. I ripped the phone and threw it in the back of my SUV, and I said, you can text, and you can go get your phone and sit in the back seat, but I said, you're not driving me. And I, I will tell you, I practice what I preach. I put my jacket and my phone is in my lapel pocket in the back seat. So I do not attempt to text and drive. And I would be fully supportive of whatever company policies there are against members utilizing the phone while driving. I, I believe uh, um, Dave's company, you have to pull over with C.R. Meyer um, if you're gonna make any calls, if you're gonna do anything, so uh, we're 100% supportive of company vehicles and distractive driving. And Steve Rank, if you're listening, I don't think that would be a bad thing to convey to the members just in general and in life because I, I hate driving down the road and seeing the person next to me, man nor woman, uh, looking on their phone and drifting from lane to lane. It's like one of my personal pet peeves. So I am with you 100% as the leader of this organization. 
do what you need to do to make sure that we can uh, uh, eradicate that from being an issue. Yeah, and I would back that up also. I know in our company, I've, we've outlawed uh, texting while driving, uh, looking at your phone, anything of that nature. And the only calls we can make is if you have hands free. I wish they would disable it while in motion. And uh, there's got to be a way of doing that. But anyway, you would think somebody would find a way to override it, but I hear you. And, and I think as, a, as an industry, we're getting better there. It's something we're pushing and looking at. So, all right, uh, Heather. Ricka Bona, and Heather, I apologize, I probably pronounced your last name wrong, but uh, she's asked, can or has Impact considered a point-based incentive system per iron worker set terms? Example, a bonus or credit if no accident or negative drug test for five years. Although employers may have their own safety incentives, many iron workers often move around to various employers. If they had a governed incentive, it might make a difference. So Heather. your thoughts are Heather, you're speaking music to my ears because I'm going to tell you a couple things. First of all, Mr. Picks from the Pacific Northwest, they had drug testing long before Impact did. And they always remunerate the employee or the member when they go and they have a positive drug test. They bake that into their fabric. And I, I bring that up at every possible Impact meeting that there needs to be some carrots and not just sticks. There can't be punishment for failing and the employee assistant program, we want that, but there's got to be some kind of reward. And so I've brought that, and there's a variance of opinion on whether you should compensate someone or it's just the right thing to be drug free and fit for duty. But I strongly believe that there should be that incentive. Uh, bring it up, but it's never been with any rave majority. Uh, the incentive program, as the impact RAB co chair, I brought to the big board, Lyuna had a safety incentive program, and we were ready to roll it out with a Dodge or a Ford pickup truck or Chevy pickup truck to a pool of winners. We had a prize structure, and we were going to reward time for you know accident-free work. And the previous presidential administration through the Department of Labor said that any kind of safety incentive program dissuades accident reporting and they banned direct incentive programs mm. there are creative ways around it but i think it's bullcrap and uh, i think that you should reward people for good behavior i know uh i had plant vogel if a member refers another member to work now they're rewarding them with a retention bonus with a gift card if the guy uh if the member stays on the job six months and at a year, the referring member gets it. So I joked and told him the business manager, we sent 550 guys to work before the incentive program. How about that business manager? They said, that's his job to send iron workers to work. So <laughs> fell on deaf ears. But Heather, you're, you're, I, I think it, we need to find better ways of doing that. And I think those are great suggestions. Yeah, and I would agree with that. Any anything, anytime we can think outside the box to improve safety and, and and get the message out there, that's a great thing. So thanks for that. Uh, Anthony Hunter has asked uh, site safety conditions from mud to icy slabs, and again, that's something uh, we're all facing, especially this time of year, uh, are more frequent. Who is responsible for controlling the safety of our iron workers? Through the steel erection negotiating rulemaking process, it put the burden, I believe, on the controlling contractor to provide adequate laydown areas, truck assembly, and conditions. Our problem is we've been fighting since I got here in 2011 for a reinforcing standard that allows for similar uh, for our rod busters. We believe site conditions are substandard. Trucks oftentimes get stuck in the mud. Members are subject to that. So um, the union is 100% uh, supportive, and we tried to make a general consensus that the controlling contractor would provide suitable access for both uh, the steel erector, the curtain wall guy getting dropped off, Miss Metals guy, whether it's a shop member dropping off uh, fabricated steel or our uh, reinforcing iron worker. We, we, that is a common goal of ours, and it's something – Steve and I have made numerous, Steve Rank, our safety, executive director of safety, have made numerous trips to the Department of Labor. I've been chirping in Secretary Acosta's ear, 
We've been waiting for a permanent appointment to the uh, Secretary of OSHA, uh, which hasn't happened. It's an interim basis, but we've had ongoing dialogue and it's, it rolls off my lips every time I see a secretary and have a chance to talk in a respectful manner. All right. Um, so it looks like the last question we have, at least for now, is uh, William Saylor has asked, has impact encouraged the stretch and fletch programs and our members buying into this pre preventative practice? Just like drug testing and some of the other things, when something is new, the implementation is spotty. It's going to be met with resistance. I think more and more general contractors and more and more owners are requiring it. Uh, I have a simple philosophy is if that's a requirement and it's been put in the bid specifications, the iron worker is going to participate uh, with no bull crap or no lip. There are people who mock it, but there is safety and data that supports that it's uh, reducing soft tissue and other injuries. And quite simply, if uh, they're willing to pay you to be ready at the start of a day and do those, then we're gonna participate with whatever the requirements are. So if, I hope that's encouraging enough. Do we have it as a broad message that everyone should do it? Probably not, if that's what uh, the intent of the question is. I, I don't mean to be flippant in my answer, but uh, it is becoming more prevalent uh, and more readily accepted every day. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, at this point in time, we don't have any more questions. So um, I would like to thank you, Eric, for your time and for coming on to our, again, as I stated, our first safety call. I appreciate your insight and um, everything you've offered to us. Oh, looks like we have one more. Uh, this one comes from Timothy Lee. He asks, back to the cell phone topic, would the iron workers position on employees, or what is the iron workers position on employees having cell phones on the job site? I, uh, um, in my former responsibilities, I was the head of the architectural and ornamental department for the iron workers international. And it was a regular company policy of many of the contractors that they didn't want workers to be distracted and they either had to have their cell phones in their vehicles, in their lunchbox, or in the shack. Never had a problem supporting that as long as it's uniform and they don't pick and choose who does and doesn't. What's good for one is good for all. That being said, now, today, my son's contractor gives him 100 bucks a, a month uh, for his cell phone utilization and they text him and they encourage it. So I think there's a disparate uh, management philosophy on that. And uh, I know they'll text people, hey, the truck's on the dock, come on down in a high rise communication. But we will support a company's policy if it's to not have any cell phones. It bugged the crap out of me to drive down the street when I was back home in downtown Chicago and see someone hooking on a truck on a high rise and they got a phone cradled under their ear. I want to go up and I ju it's just the old school part of it. So I have no problem with it not being there but I also recognize some employers may want that as part of, you know, like uh, you know, safety. You know, we used to rely on two-way radios. We used to rely on a lot of different things. And that methodology has changed. And especially the younger you get ironworkers, the more like they live with their phones. You know, for me, I, I'm, I'm done with, uh, I'm with that uh, position on there. So. Okay. Uh, looks like another one. Um, Joe F. has asked, do the iron workers have any program that goes into the high schools that get interest in the students that college isn't necessarily in their future? Uh, you know, we, we have a program where Impact provides pull up displays for mostly they subcontract it to the apprenticeship coordinators to develop a network into high schools. We're challenged by society demanding that you're a failure unless you go to college. And I say college isn't for everyone, and um, we have rewarding careers in our industry. And so we have a messaging through impact for our coordinators and for the local unions to do that. I would say the variant of participation probably varies area by area, but it's prevalent in a lot of areas where we're not going, we're competing with secondary education for the young men and women to try and get in our business. 
and I'd much rather have them uh, before they develop a lack of a work ethic, try and get them before they uh, waste their parents' money going to college to reward a, a parental request only to find out that they would prefer, you know, some work boots and blue jeans and maybe a, a practical uh, job versus an office job. Okay, well, it looks like that is our last question. Uh, we've been on for an hour, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna end it here. Again, I wanna thank you, Eric, for your time, for getting on with us on this first call. Uh, we're excited about uh, the venue and what we can do moving forward with this. And uh, again, thank you for your time and your insight and uh, look forward to, uh, to seeing you again someday on this. So. Safety is everyone's business. It's uh, the union's business. It's the employer's business. It's the responsibility of each one of our members. And I won't stop champion until everyone goes home safe. Okay, great. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you everyone for getting on with us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and leave you with our final screen share here. And I'm going to get that up. And it's gonna really talk about our next group of calls. Uh, here they are. I would encourage you to please join us. Uh, June 26th, we're going to have Jim Stanley. Uh, I know Jim personally. He is a walking OSHA, probably knows more about OSHA than they do. He can really get into, he's going to talk about um, current things that OSHA is hitting on and um, really get us up to speed on that. Uh, September 25, we have Steve Rank, who is, as Eric mentioned earlier, the Executive Director of Safety and Health for the Ironworkers. He's gonna talk about, uh, as it says, understanding roles and responsibilities for supervisors. And our final one is gonna be Billy Smith. He's really gonna talk about crane assembly and all the new NCCO regulations. So again, thank you for your time and look forward to, uh, to hearing, having you with us again on June 26th. Everyone uh, out there be safe and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you so much and be safe and take care.